Good evening and welcome. I'm Zita Strickland from Pacific Science Center, and I'll be your host for tonight's virtual Science in the City talk. Thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate you taking the time to connect with us this evening for this virtual event. Now, while this is a virtual event, it's still interactive, and we'll be using the chat box on YouTube this evening. So if you have any questions or comments for our speakers during the presentation, you can go ahead and put it in the chat box, and then we'll be asking that question of our speakers after their initial presentation. But we'd also like to hear from you now. So drop us a line and let us know where you're watching from and how many people you're watching with. Now, tonight, before we start, I have a few pieces of information I'd love to share with you. And first is that all of our Science in the City talks that we've done virtually are all available on our YouTube page. So you could rewatch Mars surface exploration, past, present, and future in advance of the Mars rover lander happening in February. Or you could check out the Science Behind Climate Pledge Arena. All these talks are found on our Science in the City playlist on our YouTube page. And in addition to these Science in the City talks on our web pages, you will also find activities that can be done at home or in the classroom and programs for students like our virtual plant field trips or programs for private or corporate groups with our curiosity breaks and our premium planetarium experiences. You can learn more about all these programs at paxi.org. Now, many of these educational programs, including tonight's event, are made possible thanks to generous support of donors. In the face of challenges like COVID-19 and climate change, science and an informed public are absolutely essential. And if you're able, we'd like to suggest a $15 donation for tonight's event to help us ensure that curiosity never closes. For information about donating to Pacific Science Center, please visit paxi.org support. And now for tonight's event. Well, misinformation and disinformation and fake news abound, and it's increasingly difficult to know what's true. Our media environment has become hyper-partisan, science is conducted by press release, and we're currently living through the first pandemic in over 100 years with a presidential election that's rapidly approaching. Learning how to be a skeptic in this age of misinformation is more important than ever, and it's up to all of us to analyze and evaluate the information available, especially before we hit share. Now, we may be able to spot political speak baloney pretty easily, but we're not as well equipped to look at misinformation that's increasingly cloaked in the language of math, science, or statistics. Well, our two speakers tonight will help us gain some of the skills needed to be a skeptic in our data-driven world. So we have two speakers tonight. Our first is Jevin West, Associate Professor at the Information School of the University of Washington. He's also the co-founder of the Data Lab and the director of the new Center for the Informed Public at the University of Washington. His research and teaching focus on the impact of technology on science and society with a focus on slowing the spread of misinformation. He develops methods for mining the scientific literature in order to study the origins of disciplines, the social and the economic biases that drive these disciplines, and the impact of the current publication system has on the health of science. Now, I mentioned he's the director of the Center for the Informed Public. This is a new center at the University of Washington. Its mission is to resist strategic misinformation, promote an informed society, and strengthen democratic discourse through research, policy, education, and community engagement. To learn more, please visit cip.uw.edu, and we've put that link in the chat on YouTube as well for you to check out. Also joining us tonight from the University of Washington is Carl Bergstrom, Professor of Biology. Now, the unifying theme running through Carl's work is the concept of information. Within biology, he studies how communication evolves and how the process of evolution encodes information in genomes. In philosophy and social sociology of science, he studies how norms and institutions influence scholars' research strategies and, in turn, our scientific understanding of the world. And within informatics, he studies how citations and other traces of scholarly activity can be used to better navigate the overwhelming volume of scholarly literature. Lately, he's become concerned with the spread of disinformation on social networks, and he's trying to figure out what we can do about it. Now, one of the things that Carl and Jevin are doing about it and to combat misinformation is a course at the University of Washington. 
And that course has led to their recently published book called Calling Bullshit, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World. And they're here tonight to share with us some of the tools to be a skeptic in this world. Carl, Jevin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Welcome. Thank Thanks you. for having us, Zita. This is going to be super fun. I'm going to try to share my slides. Is, that, is this a good time to do it? This is great. And All I'll right. let you know if it doesn't work. All right. So you give me the thumbs up if you see it. Do you see it? I see it starting. Thumbs yep. up. You're, All right. Ready. Perfect. Well, before I begin, I just want to say how much of a fan I am of the Pacific Science Center and how much of fans my kids are of the Pacific Science Center. And when we think about misinformation and disinformation, there are lots of organizations out there that are doing something about it. And certainly the Pacific Science Center is one of those solution organiz organizations. So whatever you can do to support it, they didn't pay me, they didn't ask me even to say this, but definitely support the Pacific Science Center because now more than ever, they, they really need our help, um, partly because they have to be closed, but also because this takes a lot of work. So I'm gonna get started right away. There's lots to talk about. We could, we, we're, you know, we could talk for 60 hours, but I think we only were allowed 40 minutes. So here we go. As we all know, uh, we are inundated with information each and every day. We also know that so much of it is BS. Sometimes it can start as a little brush fire on the internet in some corner of the internet. And soon it overtakes an entire area, country, community, and even the world. That misinformation and disinformation can get, can clog the line so bad that they can overtake 911 centers. Not the smoke here, but the misinformation and disinformation. This happened in Mason County, Oregon during the major fires that we had a couple of weeks ago here in the Pacific Northwest. The 911 call centers were completely jammed by concerned citizens that had seen Facebook posts that either someone from Antifa or Proud Boys had started fires. So the emergency responders couldn't even get to the actual fires and respond to the actual emergencies. So misinformation, disinformation isn't just a minor annoyance on the web. It can really hit home and it can affect um, health and safety. It can start as individual Facebook posts in Woodenville, Washington, like this particular post did here in Washington. This post claimed on Facebook that only 6% of the deaths of COVID were caused by, by COVID claiming that the CDC was hiding this particular number, that really it was a very small number of people that were dying from COVID, which of course is not true. What they, were, that what they had missed is that there are other causes of deaths like pneumonia or heart disease that were ultimately caused by COVID and led to a, a person's death, but it certainly wasn't only 6% of the deaths re uh, reported by CDC being caused only by COVID. Now this was refuted really quickly and this could have been a Facebook post that just like went unnoticed on the corner of the internet, but within a very short amount of time, it was picked up by individuals, shared, picked up by uh, a major influencer in the QAnon network and shared and ultimately led in a very short amount of time to the, um, to the Twitter account of the leader of the free world. And it was retweeted out and required a full-time fact checker, a journalist that has spent his lifetime refuting misinformation to have to write a story and, and explain why this was wrong. This was a, a local journalist that worked for the Seattle Times that now works for lead stories. So these kinds of things can spread like wildfire on the internet, just as the actual fires that we've seen in the physical world. I mentioned QAnon as one of the retweeters of that previous tweet or previous, previous um, Facebook post. Now QAnon is a relatively new conspiracy group, started in 2017, but it, like many of these conspiracy theory groups have built on other conspiracies from the past and actually uh, constitute many of the same individuals, um, depending on which conspiracy theory you're looking at. Now this could have been just a small little uh, online group that no one noticed, but today, it's grown so big that over 70, uh, 70 countries have had in-person physical protests with people claiming allegiance 
to this idea of QAnon. QAnon is this um, uh, fringe idea that, uh, that Satanists and, and Illuminati of Hollywood stars and uh, politicians are running the world and trafficking uh, child, children across the world. And this particular idea has now intersected with many of the, the issues and conspiracies around the pandemic and now the election. But just a few hours ago, literally today, just a few hours ago, it's become such a problem that Facebook had, it has now just banned all of QAnon across its platform, about 1500 different groups and individuals. This is a pretty big deal because Facebook and Twitter and most of these tech pl pl platforms do not wanna get in the game of removing um, content and certainly not removing users, but it's become such a problem that they had to remove. So it started as a small little fringe group on 8chan um, and now has grown so big that it's gotten national news in its takedown by the largest tech platform in the world. So again, starts very small as a brush fire and grows tremendously. Ideas as fringe as 5G technologies being at the root of the spread of COVID, the idea that it, it uh, suppresses our immune system is, and is really the cause of why we're seeing COVID. Now, of course, this is another conspiracy theory that's, of course, completely wrong. And what you're looking at here is the number of tweets on this, uh, around this conversation during the last, uh, 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 from January to April. This is data that we collect in our lab. And what you see is this massive explosion in April where this went again, as it sort of started as a little small fire and then exploded. Um, and it constituted about one in every hundred tweets about all of the tw uh, tweets that we had collected on, on COVID-19 were about this 5G conspiracy theory. So you can see how far it can spread and the impact it can have. So that, you know, uh, and that's in addition to the World Health Organization having to come out to the world and say, we are dealing with a major problem here, this pandemic, but almost just as, as, as problematic is the infodemic, the misinformation and disinformation that's exploding across the web and across conversations when it comes to detecting COVID and treating COVID, et cetera. Such a problem that the World Health Organization and many organizations after that have really committed to devoting um, resources and time to with with this particular problem. So it's a it's it's really a crisis proportions. And what we want to talk about today, Carl and I want to talk about ways that you, as an individual information consumer, and as organizations and as a community in the Pacific Northwest, how we can be better at putting out these fires before they spread too far. But we need to first talk about what we mean by BS. So Carl, you want to take over? Yeah, you'll have to uh, you'll have to unshare. Okay, I'll stop sharing. This one's we're getting better at this. This we're, one's we're... set up. This one's set up a little differently than we are uh, than we're we're used to. Um, so there we go. All right. So if we're gonna, I mean, we're if so. First of all, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, if we're gonna be talking about BS and uh, and about how you can look out for it and how we can deal with it and address it, it's good to have a definition to start with. And so Jevin and I have spent a fair bit of time thinking about precisely what we mean by this. Uh, and, and what we mean when we talk about BS is we're talking about language, statistical figures, data graphics, and other forms of presentation that are intended to impress or overwhelm you or persuade you uh, presented with a blatant disregard for truth, logical coherence, or what information is actually being conveyed. So the idea is that they're trying to throw enough at you, um, you know, whether it's in terms of like fancy graphics or, or flowery language or tons of facts and figures or whatever it is, that you don't feel like you can question it. You don't feel like you're empowered to be able to fight back, if you will. And then you're being pulled along on this source of disinformation or misinformation that's presented with a disregard for, for what you're actually learning. Um, so I want to just give you an example, I think, of, you know, that really captures what I mean by BS. This is a letter that uh, um, Sigmund Freud wrote to a friend of his, and he's talking about a public lecture he gave. He says, so I gave my lecture yesterday, and despite a lack of preparation, I spoke quite well and without hesitation, which I ascribed to the cocaine that I'd taken beforehand. I told about my discoveries in brain anatomy, all very difficult things that the audience certainly didn't understand. But all that matters 
is that they get the impression that I understand it. So this is classic BS. He's intending to impress, overwhelm, and persuade this audience, make them think that he's an expert who has all of this arcane knowledge. And he's presenting it in a way that shows a blatant disregard for what information he's actually conveying to them. He says, they didn't understand it, and that doesn't matter as long as they feel like I did. So that's the sort of thing I'm talking about with BS. Now, I think we're all reasonably good at spotting BS words. Uh, you know, we, we've been dealing with this for a lifetime. And so we know how to, you know, read through a politician's empty promises or to make sense of a claim like this, you know, if a company describes itself as our collective mission is to functionalize customer driven, customer driven enterprise solutions for leveraging underutilized portfolio transparencies. I mean, we don't typically think, wow, that must be doing something really important. We typically think, wow, that company doesn't have any idea what it's doing or doesn't want us to know what it's doing. Uh, so we're good at seeing through that, but I think numbers are an awful lot harder. Uh, numbers are tricky because they seem to come straight from nature. Numbers don't seem to be subjective. They're not someone's opinion. Numbers seem to be these objective truths that can just be collected and then reported about the world. And in addition to that, numbers, can feel really technical. Uh, you know, they can be presented in the guise of statistics or, or, or of machine learning algorithms and things like this. And so we don't necessarily feel comfortable challenging them. You know, we might read something like this in a medical journal. Uh, so you might read, well, short of statistical significance after Bonferroni correction, P equals 0.13, our results underscore a clinically important effect size, relative odds of survival at five years equal 1.2, that challenges the current therapeutic paradigm. And you know, when you read something like that, you think like, wow, you know, that's that sounds super sophisticated. They've done all this fancy math and they've got all these numbers. And 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 you don't necessarily, especially if you're not a you know professional statistician or something, you don't necessarily think to start asking questions like, well, if this is not statistically significant, uh, why are they saying that it has an important effect size or challenges a paradigm or anything when basically they couldn't get their experiment to work? Um, because we just get kind of overwhelmed. Uh, you know, this is the, this is, this is again, this, this notion that numbers are very, very effective way to persuade and overwhelm and impress and keep us from asking questions. And, uh, and so, you know, more and more, we're, we're confronted with numbers in the world. So much of the information that we're presented in the news, in technical reports, in our jobs, every other way is now built upon data, is built upon numbers, because we live in this extremely data-rich world. And yet, at, at the university level, high school level, and at the university level, I don't think uh, education has caught up. So we are not teaching our students to question numbers. Our students are very, very good because this is what we teach at working out the mechanics of working with numbers. They can do a particular statistical analysis or they can, um, you know, they can write computer code to, to, to run a particular algorithm. But we're not doing a great job of teaching people how to step back and say, well, wait a minute, where did those numbers come from? What do they mean? Why are they relevant to the question at hand? Jevin, I'll turn it back to you here as soon as I can stop sharing. All right. That's all you. So we want to share this with our students, but of course we want the public to know this. And you don't need advanced degrees to do most of the BS calling, at least when it comes to numbers and data and statistics. As Zena showed uh, early, we, uh, we recently released a book um, uh, in August on this topic. And I should just pause just for a second to throw out a quiz question real quick for everyone and see if anyone can answer it at the end. Why is it that we call it the art of skepticism instead of the science of skepticism? So that'll be for everyone at the end to try to answer if you have an idea of why we would have gone with art rather than science here. Um, so this, this, the book was based on a, a class that we started at the University of Washington back in 2017, something that Carl and I had been talking about actually years before even that. Um, and in this class and in the book, we hit lots of different topics, but these are the main topics um, that uh, we, we generally hit. We always sort of add new things here and there. And we're gonna hit a few of those in the rest of the lecture today, just to give you some take home. So when you go home today, hopefully you feel a little bit more empowered to call BS on some of the, the graphics you may see or some of the claims that you might see in a health magazine or, or, or some news site that you, that you um, read on a daily basis.
Um, so we'll hit today correlation causation, selection bias. We've talked a little bit about misinformation, disinformation, but we could, of course, talk for hours about any of these things. We'd love to talk about the nature of science. We've decided that that will be for the Q&A if you want to, or um, we can do a follow-up. The cool thing is that the class or parts of the class um, are being taught at universities across the globe. We've received emails and requests from over 100 universities, so there's a little bit of a BS movement going on in education, and we certainly need it for sure. Okay, Carl. Okay. Back. We're getting used. To, we've done this. We do the switching before, but we're still not perfectly smooth like we are in person. So, um, so you know, we, I was talking about the way that numbers can be can be terribly misleading, and one of the ways that numbers are misleading is people just throw them out there in ways that that they're not really put in a relevant context. And so we see these numbers and they seem really big or they seem really small, but without appropriate context, it can be really hard to figure out what they mean. And by what I mean by context is really, you need to be able to make comparisons. You need to be able to make reasonable comparisons. And so I'm just gonna give you one very simple example. Um, you can think about many more uh, kinds of examples like this, but here is a recent uh, um, headline from NBC News. And they say, preventing the next pandemic. I'm gonna draw a lot on the pandemic when we talk today, it's going on, it's on all of our minds. And my day job right now is as a infectious disease epidemiologist. And so I'm working about 80 hours a week on the pandemic. And so it's um, you know, definitely something that uh, um, it offers a lot of opportunity to think about how we as a society were relating to numbers and how they can help us, but also mislead us. In any case, so NBC News says, preventing the next pandemic will cost, and then there's this huge number, dollars two, 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 zero, 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 zero um, a year scientists say. And, uh, and so you sort of look at that and you think, well, my gosh, you know, that's just unbelievably expensive. What are we possibly going to do? And the way that number is written leads you to think that because it's just written out as this huge string of, of digits. Of course, the number itself is actually just $22.2 billion a year. Even saying it that way makes it much easier to start to think in context about what that means. Then you could bring some facts online. And uh, so, a, you know, recent study in Forbes estimated that the coronavirus is going to um, take about an $8 trillion chunk out of the U.S. economy. So it'll take about an $8 trillion hit from the coronavirus pandemic, just economically. And so if you, you know, hold that up against your $22.2 billion it would cost to, to, to prevent a pandemic, um, we could spend $22.2 billion a year for centuries, for about 360 years, and still come out ahead compared to what we're going to lose economically from the from the current pandemic. Or we could put that in context of the US federal budget. The, the number was $22.2 billion a year for the globe, but suppose the US wanted to take the entire uh, challenge on of preventing the next pandemic. Well, the US federal budget for this year is about uh, uh, $4.79 trillion. So the $22.2 billion, it's less than half a percent of our budget. So for less than half a percent of our, um, our annual uh, national budget, you could present prevent uh, a future pandemic. Another way, another thing you could do, you could look at it in, in light of uh, how many people there are in the US. So there are 330 million people in the United States. So it's $67 per capita, this $22.2 billion. Um, you know, I don't know anybody who wouldn't very gladly uh, pay $67 to have avoided the, the past seven months of this and however many months that we're looking forward uh, to um, moving forward. So this is an example of how, you know, once you take a number that looks big and scary like that and you put it into context, it can, it can uh, let you think about it in different ways and see what it actually means. And we should be demanding that of the sources that provide numerical information to us, whether it's uh, on social media or traditional media or whatever the case may be. So when we teach our course, there's sort of a key schema that underlies almost everything we do. We're trying to teach a very broad audience of students. Um, we have students from 40 majors. Uh, many of them are in the arts or the humanities. They've never taken a, a, a science class or a math class at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, we want to teach them that they don't have to be beholden to the people who have the numbers. You don't have to be intimidated 
by people that come with statistics in hand or fancy algorithms in hand or anything else, you can still ask questions. And the logic of how you do that is like this. Any kind of data analysis takes the same fundamental form. You collect a bunch of data um, at left here, that data gets put into a black box. It gets put into some kind of analytic procedure and maybe it's a um, <clears throat> logistic regression. Maybe it's a random forest algorithm, whatever it is, you uh, are gonna analyze the data using some kind of technical machinery. And what we encourage our students to do is, is don't even worry about what that machinery is for the time being. Think of that as just a black box. Then out of the black box comes some output, the results of the, of the regression or the, um, or the predictions of the, of the algorithm or whatever it is. So you get some output out and then people take that output and they derive and they make interpretations from that. They tell you what the numbers mean. When claims based on numbers are BS, it's almost never because there's some BS that's going on inside the black box. It's almost never because there's some artifact of how the statistics were actually calculated or something like that. Happens occasionally, but it's really rare. It's almost always because the numbers that get put in, the data that get put in are not uh, sampled in an appropriate way or because the conclusions that people draw as they go from the output of the algorithm to interpretation are not reasonable. And so what we're gonna do in much of the rest of the talk is give you a couple of illustrations of, uh, of both sides, both this sort of output side and this input side. And if, what, if you can train yourself to, instead of you know, getting intimidated by the fact that there is a fancy black box there, just to ask um, using basic logic, well, uh, you know, are these, is this interpretation a reasonable interpretation of what they found? Are the data that they're using uh, appropriate for asking the questions that they're asking? These are things you can do without a statistical or mathematical or science training. And it can be a very, very powerful way to see through uh, nonsense, misinformation, disinformation, and so forth. So um, I'll give you an example of, uh, of, of one of these cases where you're going from output to, uh, to interpretation uh, that may not be reasonable. So this was a, this was a um, report in Forbes recently. Uh, this is bald men are at higher risk of severe coronavirus symptoms. Um, and so what, they, what they're uh, claiming, what this is really about, this is really a story about correlation and causation. Um, you know, there was a, there was a, uh, a medical study that went through and looked at the outcomes, the health outcomes of a number of coronavirus patients and also looked at the degree to which they were, they were bald. And what it observed was a correlation between baldness uh, and um, COVID risk. And, uh, and then what the story that they put, so that was sort of the output of this um, of this correlation analysis, of the statistical analysis that they'd done. And then they put a story on top of this and they said, okay, the, then we've got a hypothesis that uh, there's an endocrine involvement. There are these hormones that, uh, that cause uh, men to, um, to display male pattern baldness. And those same set of hormones are also responsible for increasing COVID risk. And they put together, and here's a picture from the paper, they put together this very fancy causal pathway where you have a lot of different hormones interacting with a lot of different receptors. And they've got some you know, indications of what genes might be involved here on the X chromosome. And, and the basic idea is that, is, is that you know, through these same pathways, you both uh, have, uh, you know, have this kind of generative process for male pattern baldness, and it's acting on the ACE2 receptor, which is um, increasing the probability of cell infection with, with COVID. So very fancy um, story there. But you could ask a very, very simple question that would, uh, that would that, you know, so this is sort of, this is the interpretation they've given it. Um, the Forbes was, was forced to, to issue a little correction because there was a very simple question that someone didn't ask. And here's the correction. Update. This piece has been clarified to note that the study did not control for age, which is a risk factor for both hair loss and severe COVID-19. So in this case, you know, the, the interpretation that they've given it while not, you know, definitively wrong was certainly not necessary to generate the pattern that they saw because we know perfectly well um, that older people are more likely to be bald 
And we've learned with this disease that uh, the risk of severe disease gets much, much worse the older you get. And so this pattern, um, you know, ends up not being, uh, you know, while the correlation that they found through their analysis was, was indeed there, it did not in any way provide reasonable evidence for, the, uh, for, the, for this fancy, uh, you know, uh, endocrine story that they were trying to tell. Shevin? All right, if you'll do a stop, then I'll do a share. So the example that Carl gave is one of a nearly infinite number of examples that you'll see in the news, on, in, in the media, on social media, um, and even in science. Um, clearly, we would think it's important if we could devote an entire chapter, actually, we could devote the entire class to this particular issue. Um, but, it, but it is happening all over the place. So there was a recent study published that looked at the 50 most shared research studies about health outcomes. And a third of those journal articles misattribute causality based on correlative evidence. And a half of those news articles, uh, and half of the news articles about those articles did so. It's not as surprising that the news articles were misattributing causality the thing that was crazy to me is that a third of the journal articles by scientists who should be trained in this were also doing the same thing. So it's all over the place and we as information consumers need to pay attention as much as we can. That's a whole bunch of different uh, tools you, and skills you can develop to, to deal with it. But let me give you uh, a typical example that you'll see, especially in the health news arena. So here's a study that was published um, that looked at physical activity and the risk of 26 different types of cancer. It was a large scale observational study that did quite a good job in not making cause, causal jumps in their claims. They note throughout the paper that this was observational and that's it. But as soon as this particular paper was published, guess what happened? Time Magazine writes in, uh, in their headline, exercise can lower risk of some cancers by 20%. Now, again, it could be that exercise does cause a reduction in cancer, but that's not what the study said. And that's not what most of these studies say. And that's for the ones that actually get it right in their headline and in their discussion sections of their paper. But it didn't end there, of course. US News and uh, World Report writes, Health buzz, exercise cuts, rants, or cut, cuts cancer risk, huge study finds. Also a causal headline. And of course it didn't end there. Los Angeles Times, exercising drives down risk for 13 cancers, research shows. So exercise driving down, there's a, there's a causal um, claim in that particular headline and on and on and on. We could go on and on. I'm sure there were many others. So just to give an example, Jevin, of how it could be something other than that causal story, you could imagine that, uh, that we know that there are correlations between various uh, health risk factors and cancer, including obesity. And, uh, and it could be that people with those risk factors are also less likely to exercise for a whole bunch of other reasons. And as a result, you would get this correlation between people who don't exercise and people who are more likely to get cancer, even though the exercise itself would be doing nothing directly to, uh, to prevent cancer. Exactly. I mean, that's, and that's the kind of thing that we do in our classes. We talk about the, the alternative explanations and we, we draw these block diagrams, as Carl showed, as a way of being explicit about what the common causes are or about the, the chain of, of, of causal claims that might, um, might explain just as well as, as anything else. So what's, what's, it, what's, it, uh, what's the issue here is that of course correlations um, don't mean causation, but they tend to lead to prescriptive headlines. So you'll see this all the time, just like in the example before, where the scientific paper might say moderate consumption of wine consumption, there's, there's okay, well, yeah. a little bit of redundancy there, is correlated there. with re reduced risk of heart disease. So the news report would say red wine consumption reduces heart disease. And the prescriptive claim, which might be another headline and, and something we see probably just as commonly, um, is that you should drink a glass of red wine with dinner to stave off heart disease. That prescriptive claim right there insinuates 
a, a causal claim and you see this all the time. You certainly see it in other forms. So here's an example um, that we saw posted um, on Twitter. So it claimed here that Washington Post poll finds that NPR listeners are among the least likely to fall for politicians' false claims. Inoculate, inoculate yourself against BS, listen to NPR. Now, let's think about the different ways in which um, this could be set up. So what they're claiming here is that listening to NPR leads to being good at spotting BS. But alternatively, or, or well, I just say alternatively, the other way to think about it is you can, if you listen to NPR, or if you're good at spotting BS, you might be one that wants to listen to, to NPR. And so you can't necessarily distinguish between those two. And I would say probably maybe the, um, the second explanation there might even be a better explanation. So we decided to fire back. Actually, Carl sent this tweet out from our Calling BS Twitter account. It says, inoculate yourself against BS. Don't accept prescriptive claims based on correlative data. Carl, why don't you take over? Okay, let's see. So um, I'll grab, grab the screen back here. All right, so um, Jevin's just given us, you know, uh, further examples of, of this, of this sort of side of the of the logical flow is that we get these outputs, we get these, we see these correlations between two things, cancer and exercise, uh, listening to NPR and spotting BS. And then people leap from there to interpretations that it must be causal. Exercise must be reducing cancer. Listening to NPR must be improving your BS detector. And, you know, we, as we sort of illustrated, those causal interpretations aren't necessarily well grounded. And this is something extremely important to look out for in, in many areas of, of news reporting. I think you know, in health news, it's is somewhere where we, where we really see an awful lot of it. Now I wanna switch to the other side and I wanna look at what happens uh, when people take data that's not really appropriate, uh, that's not really a good fit uh, to, to ad address certain questions and put those inappropriate data into the black box and try to use that to do a statistical analysis. And this is a phenomenon that's known as selection bias. It's, I think, at, at the heart of what goes wrong in so much of statistics that when we teach the class, we spend a week, week and a half talking about it. And in the book, we've given it a whole chapter. And selection bias is what happens when you try to do a statistical analysis of some sort, but you look at people or objects who are systematically different from the population that you're trying to understand. So for example, if I wanna know, you know what's the average height of, uh, of, you know, of men in, uh, in Seattle, one thing I could do, I could go down to the uh, basketball A court at the, at, the, um, at the UW gym and measure the heights of the people playing on the A court and say, oh, here's my estimate of average heights. But this is going to be a really misleading evidence for, uh, you know, estimate for obvious reasons that people playing on that court are going to be good basketball players who are going to be taller on, on average than, than uh, the rest of the population. And so I'm measuring a population that's systematically different from the population that I want to know about. And when you ignore selection bias, of course, you end up with misleading estimates about things. And this is extremely common. We've seen a lot of it recently. Let's go back to Jevons fires. So um, here's something that went around on the internet in various forms. Here's two of them. Um, it was this, sort of this, you know, again, back to this conspiracy that Antifa or, uh, or the Proud Boys or somebody was setting these fires. And uh, there, so there were these various uh, maps that were put up saying, uh, you know, wow, look at these, look at these fire maps. The fires stop right at the U.S.-Canada border and right at the U.S.-Mexico border. Like, don't tell me this is global warming. Like, this is some kind of political stuff, right? Why could this possibly be? Well, the reason this is, of course, if you, if, if, you know, if you think about it, you can, track, you can track down and find out these two maps. The reason this is, is because the two maps I just showed you are maps of U.S. wildfires. So if you look only at fires, if you take a database that only shows U.S. fires and then you put it on a map, of course, you're not going to see the fires that go all up and down the East Coast um, of West Coast. And so, in fact, if you map out the fires, as I did here in, uh, in British Columbia, you see it continues up into BC, they continue down into Northwest Mexico. And this is maybe the dumbest article that I've ever been uh, uh, cited in, 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 the, in the popular press. Professors explain why US wildfires don't stop at the border with Canada. But this is straight up selection bias, is that, uh, you know, the, 
you put this map down, you think you're like uh, looking at, at, a, at a map of, um, of fires along the West Coast, but because that database that the, that the fires are drawn from is limited to the US, of course, you end up only seeing US fires and you have this artificial boundary that appears and, and people draw misleading connections from it. So that one's kind of obvious and kind of stupid, but there, there are more interesting uh, examples of selection bias that have come up over and over again as we try to understand what's going on with COVID. One really interesting one um, is illustrated here. There were a couple of dentists in New York City who observed that their patients increasingly were having very, very severe uh, kinds of uh, dental problems as we move further and further into the pandemic. So in April in New York City, the people that were coming into the dentist were having really uh, you know, severely damaged teeth, uh, bad gum disease, things like this in ways that the dentists weren't used to seeing. There were way more people with severe dental problems than they were seeing in January and February. And from this, they concluded that there must be something about masks that, uh, that is bad for people's dental hygiene. It, maybe it dries out your mouth or something like that. And uh, the problem, of course, is that they were running head on into selection bias. The people that go into the dentist in the middle of a bad pandemic are a very different population than the people that go into the dentist in normal times. If you're going to, uh, you know, if you're in the middle of a pandemic and you just have a, a, a cleaning or a little tiny cavity that needs filled or something like that, you're going to put it off and, and try, to, try to wait. If you're going to go to the dentist in New York in April, it's because you've got a really painful uh, cavity or a broken tooth or something that absolutely needs fixed right away. So these, these dentists kind of fell into that selection bias trap and, and reached a misleading conclusion. We saw something similar with a couple of doctors in Bakersfield. They wanted to try to estimate how frequent uh, uh, the, the uh, coronavirus was in California because they wanted to try to figure out how lethal it was. The thing is we see the deaths, but we don't see all the cases. So you, so you, wanted, you, want, you need to know both to know how lethal it is. So they wanted to say, okay, are there a lot of cases in California or not very many? And what they did is they tested the patients coming to their urgent care clinics um, in, uh, in March, it, and, uh, and they found that about 6.6% of the patients coming to their urgent care clinics actually had coronavirus. And from this, they were able to extrapolate and they say, wow, if those patients are a random sample of the people in California, then it should be about 12% of everyone in California should have had the coronavirus by now. And if that many people have had it, there's only been a few deaths, then it must be a very mild disease, no worse than flu. And that was their conclusion. And they went on a lot of talk shows talking about this and so on. And I think because we're talking about selection bias, you can see what's wrong with this. It's a mistake to assume that people who go to a clinic, an urgent care clinic, and in fact, the only one that had a COVID test in Bakersfield during the middle of a pandemic, it's, it's a mistake to assume that these are random people. These are mostly people who think they have COVID and have all the symptoms and want to get tested. And so that population of people going to the clinic is, uh, is you know, massively enriched for COVID cases. And so they ended up uh, wildly overestimating the incidence of, of COVID in California um, and therefore thinking and therefore underestimating the, the seriousness of the disease. Actually, we, we ran into something like this with our national policy as well. It was a selection bias issue which was that uh, as people in Seattle know very well, uh, the, the coronavirus was circulating in the Seattle area for over a month before anyone knew that it was circulating in the community in the United States. So uh, it was circulating uh, before February 1st in, in the Seattle area. And uh, it was nearly March before anyone figured out that we had community transmission. How did we miss it? We missed it because of the, the way that we sampled to see whether people had it. There was a rule in February that in order to get a coronavirus test, you had to have either tra traveled to Wuhan or you had to have recently been exposed to a known case in the US who would have come in from Wuhan. And what that did was that guaranteed that if coronavirus was spreading undetected among the population as it was, you'd never find it because you were never testing any of those people who, um, who were just members of the community who hadn't come in from Wuhan or, or been directly exposed to a case from Wuhan. So we guaranteed by picking a, a you know, foolish 
way of screening the population and deciding who to test, we guaranteed that we would not manage to pick up community transmission. And in fact, it was only picked up in, uh, in, in, late, in late February because the people running the Seattle flu study decided to run a bunch of their samples from the Seattle flu study through a coronavirus test. And they found, oh my gosh, there's a bunch of coronavirus cases in here. Um, and, uh, and otherwise, you know, it would have gone on even longer. We ended up losing a month in our pandemic response because of a uh, fundamental problem in selection bias. Jevin? Yep, got it. All right, I wanna take just a, a short pause and then we're gonna end with a couple more tips of things to look out for. Of course, this is just a sampling. Um, but one of the questions we get a lot from the community, from teachers, from students, are, you know, is you know, what can we do about it? And what can I as an individual do about it? I think one of the things is to create better habits of mind as we forage around the inform our information environments. That's one thing to look out for things like correlation, causation, mix-ups, to look at things like selection bias, to examine data graphics in ways that I'll mention briefly, to be careful of emotional responses to, uh, to news stories, to, to sort of ask if it sounds too good to be true, um, if, you know, if, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is and ask who's telling me this, how do I know it and what do they have to gain from it? Those are all kinds of things and a whole suite of other things. But what are we doing in the community? As, uh, as Zita mentioned, we have a new center for an informed public at the University of Washington. And that's a public facing center that, in, that, in, that represents all of us in the Pacific Northwest. And our, our mission as stated already is to resist strategic misinformation, promote an informed society and strengthen democratic discourse. And if you're interested in learning about some of the programming, you can go to the website. So that's one thing we as a community are doing. We're collaborating with journal journalism organizations. We're talking with big tech companies. We're talking with librarians and teachers. We're engaging across the state and across the nation. And you, we really are looking for um, engagement at all forms. We're a research center, but a big focus of ours is to get out in the communities like this, like today, and to engage in conversation about this topic. It's something that is, is sort of at the root of so many things and it's hard for us to solve a big world pandemic if we don't get the information environment right or any major crisis that we're going through right now. We also do a bunch of policy work, but I'll leave that for another discussion. I also wanna give an example of community collaboration. So Carl and I have been working with um, many people over at the Pacific Science Center, Diana and Felicia and her team and a whole bunch of other people and we, we just want to say that um, you know, Pacific Science Center is one of those organizations doing that kind of work. We put out a couple of virtual exhibits if you want to play around with them. So we've given some COVID examples today if you want to learn more about COVID um, and to just play around with a nice exhibit. If you want your students or your kids or, or others, you can go. There's a little URL. We'll make these slides available, of course, or you can go to the Pacific Science Center. We also have a new project within the center. It's called the Election Integrity Partnership. This is a collaboration with Stanford and, and other labs, Graphica and DFR, where we're monitoring in real time misinformation about election integrity specifically. We're not monitoring misinformation and fake news about Trump or around Biden. We're gonna leave that to the political commentators and the fact checkers. What we're doing in our group is monitoring misinformation around election integrity. So those things would be about procedural interference, like the dates changed or participation interference, like the line's too long, I don't wanna to vote, to things like fraud. Now, here's the cool thing. It's involving lots of different groups um, in, this, uh, in this ecosystem, including journalists, the platforms themselves, civic society, civil society organizations like AARP and the government. And here's where you can get involved. So talking about how do I help, how do we help? Um, if you're interested, we're looking for digital volunteers to help us monitor the misinformation that we're seeing on election integrity. You may have heard of some things around mail dumping or mail uh, harvesting or, or ballot stuffing, these kinds of things. Anything time you see those in your social media feeds, you can report those to us and then we can do some tracking down to see if they've gone viral and figure out ways to slow them down and let the social media companies know and journalists know. So if you're interested, you can email us and tell us you wanna be a digital volunteer in our center. Please do, because we need that kind of help especially because you'll see things that we won't see. We already have um, some digital, digital volunteers that have already gotten to work and we really appreciate, appreciate their work. Why don't you just so keep now, on going, Jen? So now what I wanna do is I want to end and then we'll open for questions 
with another important skill that we all need nowadays with graphs being in our face all the time. Certainly the pandemic has really underscored that. We see them in Facebook posts, we see them in news, uh, in news stories, we see them on TV, graphs are everywhere. So in collaboration with the Pacific Science Center um, and with Felicia's team, we created a virtual exhibit to play around with some of these common mistakes or common manipulations that you might see in data graphics. Data graphics are absolutely everywhere and you can go to this virtual exhibit, but I wanna give you one example graph from that virtual exhibit. So here is a graph of Seattle precipitation over time. And what I'm asking you is to play a little game. You're gonna tell me to either beware or share. So I'm gonna pause just for 10 seconds because we wanna wrap up here a second. What would you do? Would you share or beware? And if you would beware, why? All right, I'm looking at the chat right now on YouTube. And so there's a small lag, so we'll leave that up. And I will let you know what people are saying as they come in. Great. So Great. thank you, Zita. Pam says she would beware. Paul agrees, beware. Nobody's saying why no. yet. Okay, that's great. Uh, any oh, we do why? have somebody that says that the Y axis should start at zero. Wonderful, all Absolutely. right. Well done, it should start at zero and- We have a lot of bewares, too steady of an incline, vertical origin not at zero, it's too linear. Jackson, Talia, beware, beware. There's something else missing. For a second source. <laughs> Yes, and there's something else missing. Look at the x-axis there for a second. So yes, we should start at the origin for bar graphs like this. So there's, um, so the comparisons are, um, so this is beware. So the comparisons, um, so the, the bars themselves represent uh, the number, we call it the principle of proportional eight, the number of pixels devoted to a, a number um, is, is proportional to that actual number. So what you're seeing here is that the, X axis has this funny timeline, 1985, 1993, 2000, 2004. Um, it's pretty arbitrary. So if you're making a case that rain and the total precipitation is going up over time, um, you would certainly be uh, uh, in the right place to be asking, what about these missing years? Of course, it starts at zero or it doesn't start at zero. So that's an issue. There's this inconsistent time range axis and these deceptive baselines. Now there's some other things, of course, with this graphic but we'll end there. So this recently uh, played itself out um, in a post from the Georgia State Public Health Department. They put out a graphic that had a similar situation. I'll just tell you right now that you would want to beware with this one, partly for the similar reasons as before. You'll see an arbitrary x-axis at the, at the bottom. Now these are kind of easy. We always start off easy, make you feel confident. They get a little bit more, they get a little bit more challenging, but these mistakes happen all the time. This particular post was by the Department State, the, the, the Department State of Health in Georgia, uh, and it was around COVID cases. So this is important stuff. But there are these kinds of mistakes. Now they ended up retracting and putting up a new graph and, and admitted mistakes. So that's good. Carl, do you want to? Uh, sure, this I'll one? I'll let you just keep the keep control of the PowerPoint. So this was one that was put up um, in March. And it was a it was an effort by a well known graphic site to basically argue that the that the uh, coronavirus was not a very serious pandemic by putting it into uh, context. They're trying to present numbers in context, or at least they appear to be doing that. Saying, look, let's compare it to yeah, sure, you know, fifty six people are dying of coronavirus a day in 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 March, but uh, but compare that to tuberculosis or or hepatitis or pneumonia, uh, where far more people are dying, and so actually maybe coronavirus is really such a big deal and everyone is panicking more than they ought to be. At the time I complained about it because I said, well, it's not really, it's not a fair comparison to compare, um, you know, the coronavirus at the very start of a pandemic when it's only in a few places with all these other diseases that are endemic around the world. And what you need to do is you wait, need to wait and, and see what happens once coronavirus is spread. What happens, Jevin? So I went back a few days ago, and, and if you look at the average number of deaths per day from, uh, from April 1st to September 1st, um, you see that the COVID bar dwarfs all of the others. So once you make a fair comparison, then you get a very, very different story. And these are the sorts of things to, to be aware of as you're looking at data graphics. So from the same 
Georgia State Department of Health. They then shortly thereafter, that other after that first time access um, problem that I mentioned before, they posted this heat heat map of the different counties around Georgia, and they wanted to make a comparison, and I assume a narrative of of little change between the two different pictures on July 2nd and July 17th. There is a problem with this particular graph though. Can anyone notice, does anyone notice what that particular problem is? And by the way, while you're thinking, I realized I forgot to put in my good example. I even made sure I picked a good one before. Um, so I didn't get to do a, a share example, but this one you wouldn't necessarily at least share the comparison. So for those out there in the crowd that noticed that the bin size for the different colors had changed in the July 17th image, you would be correct in noticing that that is not a fair comparison, just like the other one. But one thing that we like to note and we try to um, repeat throughout our class in, uh, at, at the University of Washington is that you never want to ascribe to malice what can be adequately explained by incompetence and never ascribe to incompetence what could be understandable mistake. This is something called Hanslon's razor. And it's something that we want to remind everyone all the time, just because a lot of times it's honest mistake. And we want to make sure that we're not ascribing malice. And hopefully that will um, sort of get at some of the civility issues that we see online, just because we really do. I, I see most of the time when I look at mistakes, I see a lot of them just honest mistakes and I make them. Kevin, well. go back to those maps. I'll just say yeah. one thing quick and then we can wrap up. But um, it, it turns out like with this one, people got very upset and they said, well, you know, Georgia's trying to trying to hide the fact that the that the uh, number of cases is increasing dramatically and so forth. But almost certainly what happened here was that they were using automatic cartographic software. And when you use a software package like this, it takes the uh, range of numbers that you have to fill into each county and divides them up into reasonably sized bins given where the numbers lie. And uh, you know, running from the smallest numbers to the largest numbers you have. And it does all of that automatically. So these weren't ever you know, developed to be necessarily compared side by side. These were just something that they were putting out each day. And each day that software package was rescaling the numbers. And so, you know, again, it seems extreme, you know, quite unlikely that this was actually done to, as a cover up or anything else. It was just that, uh, you know, this automated software package was, was making decisions and, uh, and you know, people weren't thinking about, well, what are the consequences of those decisions that it's making for our ability to understand how, how the pandemic is progressing? Right, thanks, Carl. So that's why um, we have this hand, hand lens razor to remind ourselves because in that example, it likely was just um, uh, the, a software, not a necessary glitch, although I would say it's a glitch talking to my information visualization researchers, but that's an example of an, a common mistake. Now, one thing that we see a lot of are the, the misuse of cumulative plots. Tim Cook uh, was, uh, provided a nice example of that. When he recently, when he took over um, Apple and and showed this, you know, explosive growth with a cumulative plot, he did at least put cumulative plot on his slide presentation. But it tells a much different story if you were to report quarterly results, because um, cumulative plots, as far as we know, always go up. So if you see them, watch watch uh, out for how the stories are being told. This, of course, um, happened recently out of the White House where there was a claim of COVID testing going up. But what you'll notice if you pay attention to cumulative plots that this was another one of those um, pretty egregious examples of, co uh, of cumulative plots. So watch out for those things and the many other things with graphics. But what we'd like to do now, just with those as uh, teasers to the open discussion is to end there with a couple take home messages in this beautiful red sky photo that Carl took. So as we all know, we are drown drowning in BS and much of it's in quantitative form. We've seen that really play itself out during the current pandemic. But the COVID pandemic has really, uh, really emphasized why this, is a life, this can be a life or death context when we make policies based on these graphs, based on this data. And we need to do our best as individuals and organizations to clean up our information environments. And it, to me, it's one of the most important things that we can do. I'm of course partial, um, because I think in, uh, about this day and night, but it's something we really need to engage with. So thank you all for coming. And just 
as a reminder that this cleanup that we see uh, across um, our own region and across the world um, needs all of your efforts. Smokey the Bear sort of comes to mind, at least when I was a kid, as uh, hopefully a motivator to get out there and clean our information environments. And with that, we'll end and uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, we have a great chat going on um, and people are definitely enjoying and commenting on, on the things that you were posting. So I think it's some great examples of some new skills that we can take and really look critically at the, like this data driven BS that might be there. Um, we are gonna move on and take more questions from the audience right now. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the YouTube comment thread um, and then we will, we will ask. Uh, if you do have a question that's specifically for Carl or Jevin, just note who it's for. Otherwise, we'll see who answers it. Um, I'm going to start out. You had mentioned, and you were talking earlier about some of the different pitfalls that we might run into. Um, and someone was hoping that you could distinguish a little bit more between the difference between selection bias and skewed data. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I think they, they could be synonyms for one another, um, you know, with the uh, there can be all there can be various ways that data can be can be skewed. Of course, you know the term skew is can also be just a simple technical term uh, for describing the shape of a statistical distribution. So I assume the question is not meant in that sense. But um, but I mean I think that uh, many of the times that you have data that are uh, skewed differently uh, in your sample from in the population at large, there is some kind of selection bias that is underlying that. There's some way that, you know, the only the way that you're going to get those skews is that is that the data that you've collected is going to end up being systematically different um, from a systematically different sort of subpopulation than the population as a whole. So they're, they're really essentially getting at the same thing. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a, that's a helpful framing to it. Um, when thinking about statistics, um, Liz was commenting that as a statistics instructor, she encounters a lot of students who've said that they're not math people and kind of wanted to stop there. What's your take on how do we convince society that numeracy is as important as literacy? Well, if I could do, if I only had a choice between, let's say, taking a statistics class or a calculus class. And don't get me wrong, I love calculus, it's beautiful. It has many applications in society. I would have students from middle school and high school and, and universities take statistics before, um, before even calculus. Now, again, I know it's gonna make a lot of mathematicians mad out there and math teachers mad, and I've had debates with people about this. But I think the interactions that we have with data and numbers and statistics in society, it's something that people can use each and every day. So this teacher that's asking this, I know has had to try to convince students too. So I, I don't, I'm preaching to the choir um, about this, but I, I really feel that um, anyone can um, call BS or, or can uh, sort of understand data in ways that don't require a deep understanding of logistic regression, for example or a p-value for that matter. Most, most scientists don't have a great understanding of p-values. But that's the whole point of uh, a lot of the work that we're doing in our class and also in the book is that we try to focus on areas where anyone um, with any kind of training um, can interrogate data and can identify problems um, just in the same, at, at really almost the same level of proficiency and success as someone with an advanced degree in this area. So I, I think the best way we can convince them to really say, first of all, you can do it and you need to do it is to just open up a, a, a newspaper or open up a Facebook feed or listen to uh, you know, the, the evening news or, or, or you know, pick up you know, a magazine in the dental office. You'll see graphs and statistics everywhere and it affects them, it affects what we do so we really, that one, I'm finding it's, it's getting easier and easier to show the, the, the importance of it because it really is just being thrown in front of a uh, student's face all the time. Can I take a quick crack at that question as well, Jevin? I'm gonna, sh um, I'm gonna share yes, my screen briefly do. and give you an example. This is, a, this is an example from our website. We have a bunch of, uh, at, at uh, callingbullshit.org or callingbull.org if you don't like the, 
like the curse word. Um, we have a bunch of examples. And I think one way you can teach people, uh, you know, who think they're not math people about the, you know, about the value of thinking about statistics and the importance about it is to show examples of how much information comes to us in that form. And then also show how you can see through it without having to be an expert in um, any of the fancy analytic techniques or anything like that, because it's really quite a lot of fun, I think, to you know, approach statistics from this black box framework that we're thinking about and say, can I just think logically about it? And so this is a little example where there was a, there was a paper and a, and a newspaper article claiming that it was very, very dangerous to, um, to be a rap or hip hop or, or heavy metal musician um, because there was a, a study that showed that uh, the average life expectancy uh, or, the, or the actually, so the average, sorry, the average age of death for uh, musicians in, in rap and hip hop and metal and punk was very, very young, 40 years, 35 years, 30 years, um, compared with uh, average age of death of, uh, you know, genres like blues, jazz, country. And you look at those numbers and you think, wow, that's like, that's so terrible, you know, like, people are dying in those musical genres are dying so early, what could be going on here, um, you know, is it is it that these you know they glorify hard living or 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 violence or or, or what is happening and uh but if you if you kind of step back and you think about it a little bit um and you and you look at what the what the study was doing you can see that there's uh there's a big problem with the study and that's that the um the the new genres the the people who play music in the new genres um haven't yet gotten old enough to die old so if you've died so this is this is just comparing what is the age of death among people who've died. So uh, you know, for a genre like jazz that's been around for a very very long time, there there you know uh, people were playing jazz a hundred years ago, and and so people have have died of old age if they're jazz players. But for rap and hip hop, very new genres, if someone if a rap or hip hop star has died, they've died early, they've died young, and so this is an unfair comparison that's that's uh, getting made here. This is another kind of something like selection bias. It's called right censoring. And I think just to, to show students examples like this and, you know, and, and show them that without, you know, statistics isn't just about learning how to calculate the degrees of freedom um, on, a, on some kind of, uh, on a t-test or something like that, but it's also about thinking rigorously about the data that go in and seeing through uh, claims that aren't reasonable. And I find that students love that. Uh, so that would, be, that would be something that I would encourage. Thank you so much. Um, we've talked a couple of times and you've mentioned about, you know, just as a society and some of the things that students need to learn. Um, speaking globally, Pamela's curious if there are other, if there are nations that have the most accurately informed public hmm. and why are there key elements in those societies from a big picture standpoint, like educating people or, you know, the way they approach debates, for example. I surely certainly wouldn't put the United States at number one. That's for sure. It's about the one thing I can conclude. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's there's high variance in every different country. That's a that's an interesting question. I don't have a great answer to that. I don't know if you do, Carl, about no. certain stats around um, the ability to critically reason with data in different countries. You know, I I would say even if it existed, it I, I don't know that I could trust it too much because we find that it's really really hard to measure those skills. We're sort of still figuring it out. So we've taught this class for several years now. And I know there's people that have taught data reasoning like skills for many years. It's hard to um, assess it um, effectively and consistently across different students with different backgrounds. So it's just, it's hard to measure number one. Now, maybe there is a measurement out there and maybe there are countries and students and education systems that are doing better than others. But certainly one thing that I would be putting my money on is uh, an education system that focused less on the mechanics, as Carl said at the beginning of our talk, and more on sitting around in a circle, putting up a graph or reading a paper or reading a study that they, they found um, in their social media feeds and figuring out what could be wrong with that study, what could be alternative explanations, and, 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 and doing that and spending less time sort of just showing someone how to download the library um, in R a as a way of calculating the 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 t test or something. So I think I think we need to be doing more of the the former rather than the latter. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I, I love your comment about how, you know, it, it's difficult to measure in your own class and with your students some of these outcomes. And if there's ever a couple of professors that need to present that data correctly, it's, it's you two. <laughs> yeah, better. Well, we make mistakes. I mean, that's why we definitely put up Hanlon's razor slides as much as we can, because we make mistakes just like anyone else. And students have called it on us. And those are the greatest days in class when they call it on us. Yeah, Hanlon's razor did definitely get a, a good response in the chat. Um, so a question that Marley has is, is how do you get the public to balance an appropriate amount of skepticism with also a good level of belief in reputable institutions and sources? This has been a huge concern of ours, you know, since the start of this is because we, you know, we don't want to create a generation of skeptics, right? They're creating this, one of the aims of modern propaganda is to create this sense that there is no truth or you can't get to the truth and to cause a population to give up. And so the last thing we want to do is to contribute to that. So you know, very much in what we do, you know, it's framed in this notion that there is accurate information out there. And our job is to empower people to be able to find it. Um, and so that means not being a passive consumer of information, but it doesn't mean that we're teaching people, oh, you can't believe anything, but we're just saying like, hey, look, you can be empowered to do this. You don't have to have a master's degree in data science. Um, there are these sort of habits of mind and the same way that you learn to, uh, um, you know, just have, a, a, you know, you know, if you're, if you're a parent, you kind of have a, a second sense for like when, you know, when the kid is, is up to something, usually because it's quiet, right? But, but in any case, you've got this like second sense or, you know, mom's eyes in the back of the head or whatever. I mean, you just help people develop that second sense around data and around uh, numerical claims and things like that. I mean, you can call it a BS detector if you want, but our whole point is that this is, this is a very achievable goal and is something that, uh, something that everybody can do it doesn't require any particular, you know, technical expertise. And so I think um, coming at it from that perspective is really what we're, we're trying to do and not to say that, oh, you know, everything out there is BS, but rather that, that, that there's, there's some BS and there's a lot of truth and you can, you've got what it takes to sort among them. And so we try very hard in the book to, you know, get to the point that once you've read it, you, you should be able to um, do a much better job of, of, of that. Right. And Zita, this is such an important question and something like Carl said that we're so concerned about. And it really hit me over the head when I went and talked to a middle school class several years ago. Um, and when I went in the class, I asked them a simple question. What are sources that you trust? And they all started laughing and they said, we can't trust anything on the Internet. And to me, that was a really depressing answer, because maybe that's what the new generation does see when they when they're on TikTok or Instagram or when they're talking in the, you know, about adult news or whatever, that they hear from their parents, that they hear from their neighbors. And that's not the response we want. So I dig, dug a little bit further and I said, well, could you trust Wikipedia? And they said, Wikipedia? You can't trust Wikipedia. That's edited by people. Um, and there's some truth to that for sure. I mean, certainly Wikipedia is um, edited by people and there are mistakes made and there, there are some biases likely to even exist with those editors. But it is one of those examples. It's one of the, the, the bastions of, of, of hope in, the, in, the, in getting a truth on the web, not to say that Wikipedia is perfect, but then talking about the parts of Wikipedia and how to interpret Wikipedia and to understand how it's done relative to maybe a post that they see on Instagram. And so having that discussion and saying, yes, you should be skeptical but there are ways that you as an information consumer can be uh, more discerning and that there is such thing as truth and fact and that we have to depend on experts and we have to depend on institutions. And if we don't believe anything, then we can't make big collective decisions that we need to do each and every day. So it's something that we're really concerned about. And there are times when we go into discussions and have to start a lecture by saying, okay, we're going to talk about some problems, let's say, with science communication and some of the, the, the ways in which science works, but it still works darn well. Um, and then we have to end that lecture that way as well. So I think we need to always be reminding that we can get there and we don't want the new generation and people in general to be fully skeptical because then those disinformation campaigners will have reached their goal. We don't want to completely annihilate truth. We just want to be a little bit skeptical here and there. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question when we think about um, Hanlon's razor that don't assume malice when it could be, you know, incompetence or a mistake. Um, but it does seem sometimes like there are people who are intentionally feeding oh, for sure. these, these BS fires. 
And so, you know, Pauline raises the question of, of why do media organizations continue to show bias and misleading information? Um, and sometimes repeatedly where it seems like they're not really learning that lesson and they're continuing to show, you know, the graph or the data table that is just skewed and completely wrong. For, for one pretty good reason, to make money. I mean, this is how they know that this 24 hours news cycle and this sort of engagement with your biases and this ability to get you all worked up um, and vilifying the other team and other tribe that makes money. It glues us to the it glues us to that television. And there are sociologists that have been talking about this for a long time. Neil Postman, who we quote a lot um, in our lectures and also in the book, talked about this in the 1960s. Um, and it's something that hopefully we'll get a chance as a society to sort of reflect on. Um, and maybe the actually maybe our cable news environment is just a reflection of society right now. But but the biggest reason is that it makes money and, and the platforms um, make money on that engagement and our eyeballs being stuck to those advertisements as much as they can. And so that's, I think, what drives a lot of it, as well as propaganda, of course, that exists and various other reasons why we see this all the time. So given that there is this, this big machine for the ratings and for the money that is feeding this, um, Oh, I really hope there's a positive answer here. Do you feel like you're making an impact? Troy's wondering that sometimes it just feels that no matter how much you, you approach people, sometimes they just don't listen. Do you feel you're, you're getting through? I think, um, I think that there, I mean, whether or not Jevin and I are individually having, you know, a, a world changing impact, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to claim that. I do think that uh, we have, gone through a number of transitions in information technology, all of which have led to societal crises or imagined societal crises like this. So if we go back to the advent of the printing press, this, there was an enormous amount of hand wringing about that in part because now anybody could print any old bullshit that they wanted using a printing press and commoners could print words and, and, and distribute books. And, 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 and how was anyone gonna believe anything anymore when, uh, when, when you know, books were no longer the sole province of, of the novel, of the nobility and the, and the clergy to be able to commission. Um, and, and the enormous you know, anxiety around that uh, but people recovered. They say, oh yeah, some of the stuff that's written down is bullshit. There's political pamphlets that people print that, that are full of lies, but that's fine. We just aren't going to believe everything that's written on a piece of paper and we're going to learn to, to screen or, you know, you know, when people, uh, when people started to, uh, use Photoshop, there was all this concern about, you know, oh boy, you know, now we're not going to know what's real and what's not because, uh, you can't tell whether a photo has been photoshopped, but we've all learned how to deal with that. And of course, you know, that goes way back to, to photo manipulation and, and, and so forth, but we learn how to deal with that. And, and you look for multiple sources of information. And right now the hand wringing is, is, is about deep fakes. And, you know, now we're not going to be able to tell voice or video, but you know, we've already solved that problem with Photoshop. And uh, so this is just going it, to, it's, you know, I think society has continued to adapt to the changes in information technologies. And, and uh, so, you know, my whole, and, and they do it by, by education and they do it by changing norms and finding new ways to validate uh, the claims that are out there. And so I think, uh, you know, as you go through one of these transitions, you may have a temporary period where you're a bit behind the eight ball and we may be sitting a bit behind the eight ball right now, but in terms of like, you know, long-term, uh, prognosis, I would think that this is something we'll, you know, I don't think we're like spiraling the drain. Uh, I think, you know, we'll, we'll figure out what to do about this. It's just that this idea of linking up all the computers in the world and letting everyone be an information producer, and then there's too much information uh, for anyone to sort through. So now uh, instead of allowing, you know, uh, professional producers and paid editors to choose what we see, well, let's all do it for each other. And so now, uh, you know, instead of having the editor of the New York Times choosing what comes across my feed, it's my paranoid Uncle Ron. And, and you know, it's, um, we're, we're going to need to make some shifts in order to, to, to deal with that. But I, society always has. And so I think it will again. Yeah, I, I, I like that perspective. And this all has happened really quite quickly in, in a lot of ways. Staggeringly um, so. So, so fast. Um, and there are people that have commented in, in the chat that you are making a difference and they thank you for this work that you are doing. Thank you. Uh, 
you commented earlier that universities around the world are using some of the Colleen BS curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, where can people find more information about doing this at their university? Well, so we have the uh, entire syllabus. Uh, so it's at, at callingbullshit.org or callingbull.org if you prefer. Um, that one, that one, we've used a script and gone through and cleaned out all the all the the S word um, so that you can use it in your high school class or whatever. And uh, and and so actually, that has um, it's got a it's got a full syllabus for the class um, with all the readings. It's got a uh, it's got a series of uh, case studies and tools that we've written and essays that we've written. We're continuing to add to that. I was working on one for much of the day today. Um, and uh, and it has from the first time we taught the class, uh, we taught a we taught a 10 hour version of the class, the first pilot. And we uh, we videotaped that entire pilot from a set of multiple cameras. Um, and it was broken up into these sort of, you know, five to seven minute uh, segments so you can watch one before bed or whatever and not have to sit down and watch a whole hour worth of lecture. So those are all online. They're all on the website. And so anyone who wants to use it can find all of that. Also, you know, this is like, you know, it's Jevin and I want to get the word out there. So we're, we would love it so much if people wanted to teach this material at any level. Um, we've piloted it in a bunch of high schools and it just goes amazingly in high school. There's nothing that, you know, 15 or 16 year olds like more than, than being able to call bullshit on adults and be right about it. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, you know, I, yeah, it's, uh, you know, write us, look at the website. Um, I guess, I, I guess I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to say, look at the book, but you know, whatever the website's free. Uh, well, so. all I would say is just let us know if you do, because we can link you in to um, the, the larger network of, of teachers that are using it. And also we can send you new things or you can give us ideas. So just let us know. It's the only thing we ask is just let us know that you are teaching or that you want to, and you certainly can just pick parts of it as well, but please, please do take whatever you want from it and, and please teach it and then tell us what you learned. Carl, I'll go ahead and say that you can get the book um, and it is available and it is out. But I also did watch a couple of the um, YouTube um, video clips from your lecture as well. And I so I recommend those. Those are also great. Um, speaking of this book and the class, I mean, obviously, it takes a little while to write a book like this. Did you find that with all the events of this year with with COVID, um, did you have to make some significant edits and changes to the direction and where you were going? So the book was finished before COVID broke out, okay. and um, and so it, it it actually felt it felt a little bit funny because um, you know as the as as the book was coming into actually coming into print, it did feel like it was written in a different world than the one that we live in now. On the other hand, it also felt you know I don't want to be sort of like too self congratulatory or anything, but it it felt prescient in the sense that uh, you know the book is saying that we are coming for, we're headed toward a reckoning um, because of misinformation in quantitative form. And it lays out a bunch of different ways that that happens and how to see through it. And you could take every single example out of the book and you could replace it with a COVID example. I did a lot of that in the talk tonight. Um, and, uh, and so somehow, you know, unfortunately the, the COVID situation has, has, I mean, it hasn't really added anything new. It's just a, to to the to the scope of what we're what we're writing about in the book, it's just kind of new examples with a lot at stake. I think um, right right before COVID broke out, I have a piece that uh, I've been, been working on for a while with a uh, um, with a postdoc at the Center for the Informed Public uh, called uh, "Human Collective Behavior is a Crisis Discipline," and what that paper was. Uh, arguing was that um, you know, if you link all the computers together in the world and you put people on social media, um, that's going to change the way that democratic decision making takes place and that's going to cause some big problems and we don't understand what they are. Um, and now, uh, you know, until we wrote that before COVID hasn't been published yet, and now it sort of feels like, uh, well, you know, uh, instead of being a kind of out off the wall prediction. Now it's going to be like, well, yeah, duh. And uh, so I guess that's another way that that's, that that's kind of played into all of that. Yeah, Carly, um, being an epidemiologist, there's a question that, that's come up that's um, really going to take advantage of, of your knowledge in that area. And also some thanks from our audience for working incredibly long hours and all the work that you're doing right now with COVID and still joining us tonight. So thank you for that. Thank you for um, joining us. 
a lot of the information that has been out about COVID and especially recently, it seems like, um, is really starting to go back and forth about how, you know, is it serious? Is it, what behavior should you do or not do? And so a question that someone's asked on our chat is, you know, just really confusing information the past few days. How serious is COVID? Wow. Um, you know, it, we have another is, hour here. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So this is, this is, I mean, COVID is a very serious disease. Of course, the, 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 um, you know, I, th I think the, you know, one rough, you know, way to think about it is that it's, it's, it's about, it's about as serious as getting the flu 10 times or 10 to 30 times. So, um, you know, in terms of mortality risks and, and long-term sequelae. Um, so if you think about, you know, uh, and, 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 and I mean, and I mean the influenza flu, I don't mean, you know, something I don't feel so good. I say I got the flu, but I mean the real thing where it really knocks you out for a week or two, um, and maybe leads to pneumonia. And so, so it is very serious in that way. We're getting better at treating it though. And, and so one thing we are seeing is we're seeing case fatality rates dropping off as we learn how to treat it. And I think also we're seeing case fatality rates drop off as we learn how to protect one another. Uh, it seems to be one of these diseases where the amount of virus that you are exposed to actually affects the severity of disease. And so it seems, you know, early on where you've got doctors without uh, personal protective equipment intubating patients and, and the, you know, viral particles are just everywhere in the air, you see all of these deaths of, of you know, young, healthy doctors in their 30s and 40s. Uh, we're not seeing that now because people are, are masking uh, well and, and taking a lot more precautions. So it's a disease that our society is learning how to deal with, but I don't think that we're over, I don't think, I don't think we're like over responding to it in terms of, you know, how, how serious we're taking it as a society. I guess that would be the, the, the quickest initial answer in terms of like the confusing information and all of that. I mean, I think there's you know, there are many parts to that. And one is to understand that the science is changing. And so that's why advice is changing. Um, and then the other, you know, unfortunately, there is a bit of a vacuum in terms of who we can go to to trust. I never would have thought that I would have to be somewhat skeptical of advice coming out of the CDC as being possibly politically tainted. And unfortunately, there's abundant evidence that that's now the case. And, and that's a real shame. Well, I think that you know you've given us some great tools both in this book tonight as well as the, the lecture series that you have posted on YouTube to really help people take a look. Um, Miles comments that you guys are making an impact and thank you for doing your work. Thanks, um, Miles. I think we'll wrap up. You would ask the question of us at the beginning of why is it called the art? Ah, I was seeing if anyone was, was going to pay fine. attention to that. I don't even know the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if Carl was going to come up with an answer. Uh, did anyone come up with an answer in the in the post? I'm curious. Um, we, we did. Zahida um, says that art is how it looks and science is the truth behind it. And Kieran posits that science is facts and the art is less specific. Ooh, those kind of get it. I, the, the first, both of them have a mix of things that I hadn't thought of. You know, when I think of art, like the, the art of conversation or the art of, of baking or anything, the art of, I, I think of uh, the need for repetition and practice, excessive practice to get really good at it. And so I think, you know, calling BS takes practice. It's not something you're going to learn from listening to one lecture from us or, or to even reading the book. It's not enough. We always have to practice. I have to practice. Carl has to practice. We have to create these habits of mind to create the art, you know, to be able to be good at the art of skepticism. And also, if you were just to pull the word art out and plop in science, I mean, you could, there could be kind of a science of skepticism. But when I think of the art of skepticism, I'm also thinking of human activity and human interaction and human creativity when trying to figure out how to talk with your crazy uncle at Thanksgiving and how to deal um, with that, un that very um, uh, uncomfortable conversation online or offline that you're having with people and with your, you know, and questioning your own sort of judgment sometimes. We're always sort of battling confirmation bias and the context for the time. And so there is, there's more than just a, a plus B than um, C. I think, uh, I think it's, it's, it's something that it takes a lot of practice and it's something that involves humans 
and it requires some some creativity even beyond the things that we talk yeah, about. Yeah, you hit on it at the end with the A plus B equals C is there's, you know, there's no formula for art, right? And there's no formula for being able to see through an ever changing information landscape. And uh, and so it really is, you know, like 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 you say all the other stuff, but it's that there's no formula, I think. Yeah, and and I like what you were saying about how it is a skill you can develop especially important because the type of BS that's coming in is going to change five, 10 years from now mm -hmm. as technology changes and as these streams change. Right. So I guess that's a great call to action for everybody. That's right. Wash your hands, wear your mask and practice skepticism. Talk to each other right. about it and, and work on that skill because it is a, a very important skill that we all need for the healthy society. Yes. Totally true. Yeah. Jevin's got a great expression that uh, that he says, which is uh, uh, think more, share less. And uh, <laughs> exactly. you know, for when you're using uh, social media and uh, yeah, so it's, you know, wear your mask and think more, share less. It's, uh, exactly. Let's put a little friction in those communication lines that just that, that move too fast. Let's think more and share less and thank everyone for coming and hanging out for us the whole time. Wow. Thank you all. And hopefully we'll see you all in the community. Thanks for listening and go do your good work, uh, work of calling BS. Well, and thank everybody. you so much to the both of you for being with us tonight. Um, before everybody heads out, I've got a couple more events that you might be interested in. But first off, we'd love to hear your feedback about tonight's event. So please take a couple of minutes and fill out a short survey we have for you. We put the link in the YouTube chat and we'll email it to everybody who registered in advance. If you are listening and interested in learning more about this topic, I want to invite you to tune into a very special series called Stand with the Facts. This is a series of live virtual events with KUOW and the Center for an Informed Public. And their next program is one week from today, next Tuesday, October 13th at 1 p.m. And it's going to be exploring how election disinformation targets people of color. In the lead up to the 2020 election, research shows that black voters, as well as other minority groups, are being targeted with disinformation in an attempt to flatten, discourage, and splinter voter turnout. Who is behind this effort and what's being done to protect communities from targeted disinformation? We'll join KUOW's Kim Malcolm and her guests as they discuss how disinformation targets people of color and what can be done. Again, that's gonna be next Tuesday on KUOW, on their YouTube channel or on Facebook. It's at 1 p.m. You can RSVP in advance, and you can also submit your questions or comments in advance, and they'll be included in the conversation. Again, I just want to thank Carl and Jevin so much, both of you, for sharing your expertise with us tonight. I don't think I'm going to look at a graph or an infographic the same again, which I'm so thankful for. Um, be sure, everybody, to check out our sciencecenter.org slash webpage. Um, you can view past programs at our Science in the City YouTube page, um, and you can donate at packside.org slash support. Tonight's talk will be saved on our YouTube channel, so you can share it with friends and family, or you can watch it again as a touch-up as you flex that muscle on being a skeptic. Thank you for everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you for being curious with us tonight. And I hope you all have a very pleasant evening. Bye-bye.